always exciting to come and I go around the country talking about compliance and cybersecurity, everyone's favorite subject. But I do joke, like, um, while it's not always fun, but like what we like to do, especially at Comply Auto, is we like to protect your bottom line and help you mitigate those risks. So that's what we're going to talk about. So today's um, topic is the FTC CARS rule which we don't always like to refer to it because it has kind of a derogatory, like if you know, I'm not even gonna say what it stands for, what CAR stands for, um, but it's the vehicle shopping rule. And so we kind of want to give you guys like an update on the rule and then go through it. So today we are joined, um, very privileged, uh, by Brad Miller, formerly of NADA. He is, today is his first day <laughs> Working with Comply Auto is our chief regulatory officer, and I can't think of anyone who's more experienced in this space than Brad. So I'm going to turn a lot of the meat of the presentation over to Brad. But we also have our dealer with us, Alina Sweet, with the Stevens Management Group out of California. She is their chief uh, compliance officer and has initials <laughs> behind her name that proves it. So two very, very dedicated people. So I'm going to turn that over to them. But first, let's... Um, since we have a lawyer in the room and any other lawyers in the room, is we are going to just, you know, quick little disclosure is like, this is not legal advice. You all have counsels at home, but this is just more for educational purposes. So with that, Brad, you want to... Uh, sure. Well, thank you, Cheryl. And, and uh, yes, this is, I'm, I'm the newbie at Comply. I've been in ADA for 16 years, uh, worked on this rule for, for many years, uh, including litigation, which I'll touch on today. Uh, and so these, uh, even these slides are, uh, you know, it, forgive me as I'm working through them. We, we've given you more information in these slides than we can possibly cover in this session. So keep that in mind. We'll go through them very quickly. But we want to give you a, at least a 30,000 foot, if not maybe more a 10, 5,000 foot uh, view of what this rule is going to require should it become finalized. So um, I, I don't have my, even have my, yeah, let me. Yeah, At least put my glasses on. I can see. I can see now. So uh, let me let me just start with a little level level setting because it does get confusing. First of all, remember we're talking about even the term right cars rule. It, I'll say what it stands for: combating auto retail scams. That's the that's the derogatory acronym that the FTC came up with, which is why NADA uh, and a lot of the folks in the industry call it the vehicle shopping rule. But it gets confusing, right? I mean, are we are we talking about the safeguards rule? Is this what is this a is this proposed? Is this final? So let's let's just, where are we, okay? This is a rule that is finalized from the Federal Trade Commission. Federal Trade Commission is your f primary regulator in Washington, D.C. This is a rule that applies only to automobile dealers, right? The Federal Trade Commission has been doing a lot of things in the marketplace. You've heard about, you know, whether it's antitrust or the non-compete rule, all these things they're doing. This, that, that applies to the entire U.S. economy. This is a rule that is a final, meaning it is not just proposed, it is actually a rule, and we'll talk about the effective date in a second, but it's also a rule that applies just to car dealers, okay? And I should also note, it's also a rule. Now, why is that important? As you, as you go through here, you may say to yourself, well, a lot of these things are already sort of prohibited or illegal, or I've heard of enforcement actions being brought against dealers for these kinds of things already. What, what's the deal here? The reason the rule is important, it, we can get into the weeds technically, but but currently there's a procedural protection because the FTC has this very broad authority under what's called Section 5 of the FTC Act where they can come and say something was unfair or deceptive, okay? And it's very broad. And because it's so broad, there's a procedural protection that says they can bring an action against you and say don't do whatever it is we say is deceptive, but they can't necessarily fine you the first bite, right? They'll give you a cease and desist, they'll give you a consent decree, and then if you violate that, then they can fine you, right? And what are some of those fines? Pardon me? What are some of those fines? Uh, well, the, the fines, it, it, the, the violations of Section 5 of the FTC Act is a 50 plus thousand dollar fine per, per violation, which is always a question of what's a violation and it's unclear, but they're steep, okay? So the reason a rule is important, and, and the FTC said this is why they wanted to do the rule, is that gives them the ability to immediately issue a fine, right? Okay, so I, it's not, you know, it's not chicken little to say that this, this could result in big fines because the FTC has said, we want a rule for the express purpose of being able to st go straight to that bottom line of fining people. And, and of course, in this case, fining dealers, okay? So that's why that's, that, that is important for you to understand. Okay, 
there's a long tortured history of where this came from. It started with Dodd Frank and the FTC, and 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 and, the, and then impaneling Lena Khan. You may have heard her name. She's the new chair of the FTC. They proposed the rule a few years ago. They finalized it in December. Okay, December of 2023. When it was finalized, it was originally supposed to become go into effect July 30th of this year, July 30th, 2024. But NADA, along with the Texas Automobile Dealers Association, sued the FTC. NADA doesn't sue the FTC very often, but they sued the FTC in this case. Uh, they brought what's called the petition for review. Uh, if you're interested, that means it's a, it's a procedural tool when you challenge a final rule of a, of a government agency, and you actually go straight to the circuit court. You don't go to the district court. So for those of you who are familiar with the litigation system, you normally in federal court go to the district court, and then if there's an appeal, you go to the circuit court. Here you go straight to the circuit court. So it's in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and... The, and the NEDA and uh, TADA filed the lawsuit uh, but, you know, because it's the Fifth Circuit, and hence it's in the Fifth Circuit, and sought both a stay of the rule, meaning, hey, court, we're challenging this thing. Don't let them in, enforce it. And we also, and, and NADA also said, we want expedited review. So long story short, before they had to respond, the FTC on their own came in and, and issued a stay of the rule. Okay? I'm explaining this to you because it's important to understand the court hasn't issued the stay. It's the FTC itself that's issued a stay pending judicial review. So the idea is this rule is final, but the July 30th date is no longer operative. So it's when is it going to be effective? We don't know. Uh, but it, it's, it's pending judicial review. Uh, NADA has filed their brief. The FTC's brief is due in about a week. Uh, there's, a reply, there's then a reply due in mid-June oral argument sometime after that, and then a decision sometime after that. So when that happens, of course, if NADA wins, the rule may go away, but if NADA loses, then the then the FTC will lift their stay and it'll become effective, and we don't know how long that will be. Brad, I think it is important to say that even if NADA and TADA, Texas Automotive Dealers, do win the lawsuit, it is something that we know there are certain aspects of the CARS rule that are going to stay. So when we say that dealers need to prepare for the worst, we are serious. And I'm sorry for everyone in the room. This is what I do in California every day. <laughs> um, I'm always prepared for the worst. So when you look at the cars role and the car shopping and how it actually affects dealers, what it actually means and what you need to put into place, there are there's no reason that any dealer should look at the cars role and be like, well, we'll see what happens pending, yep. like pending yeah. litigation. At the end of the day, you know that there are certain things that even if it doesn't win in the lawsuit that, you know, NADA wins, great, good for us, wrong. They are going to take major aspects of that rule and still implement them. It may not be called the cars rule anymore. Maybe they'll call it the minivan rule. Who knows? But <laughs> at the end the of junk fees, the, like there's, so there's the junk fees, so junk fees, rule. all yeah. of that stuff is still in litigation. Then there are, like what Cheryl's mentioning, they have thrown car dealers into the same a uh, lot as your ticket masters, your uh, hotel fees, stuff like that, saying that the fees that they make us already do, okay, the, the government is the one that tells us that we have to do those fees. They're now saying that they're junk fees and they're things that we are doing. We know that there's always going to be one bad apple in a bunch. At the end of the day, most of the time, new franchise car dealers or even used car dealers or pay here, pay now, they are following the rule to a T. So we know there are people that are obviously operating well within the law, but then you have the few bad actors that somehow get us lumped in with that. So as much as we say the law may or may not happen, there are things that you need to prepare for and understand how it's going to impact your business as well as your customer shopping experience. I couldn't agree more. And again, I just wanted to make sure you understood the, it, it's confusing. I get it. I get, uh, you know, get calls all the time. You know, you're you're trying to run your business, and and you're being told about these rules, and I know the safeguards rules out there, and people have been fighting that, and that's been a mountain to climb, and then this new one came. So it's, it's sometimes it just make sure we understand where we are. But I agree. At the end of the day, uh, and the problem is we don't know. So we're in a position where we're we're giving we're certainly getting ready, getting compliance advice, and, and you know, again, even if all goes perfectly and NADA wins, at most it would maybe be a you know a, a slight delay. 
Right. So this is the kind of thing, this is just the way the world is going. And so let's let's jump into uh, to what the rule requires. So again, this each also, of these- Also just real oh, quick yeah. for FTC safeguards, that's active this week. So if you have not complied with that, make sure you're on that. Well, let's, let's be, let me, let me, I'll clarify that one. Yeah. That, that The main safeguards rule was last year. There was a new requirement that just went into effect this week. So we go, ask us after the fact, because there's a whole <laughs> new one. If, if, we a haven't bunch of laws. if we haven't depressed you enough by the time you're done, then we can tell you about all the more things that we haven't had a chance to talk about. Um, so very quickly, let's just, very, at 50,000 feet, what does the rule do? If you're new to this, what, what are we talking about, okay? Um, it does a number of things. Uh, but I think the, the one I'm going to start with is probably the biggest uh, change in dealership culture, and that's the concept of an offering price. And so let me explain to you what, what this would require you to do. So the, the rule defines something called an offering price, which is basically the total amount someone uh, would be pay in cash if they wanted to buy the car, right? So uh, it's basically everything except for taxes uh, to buy a vehicle, right? So it's a $55,000 vehicle. I need to be able to pay $55,000 plus taxes and walk out with the car. Well, that means it includes dock fees, it includes uh, destination charges. It includes all uh, option or all mandatory add-ons and all the other aspects of a price that may not be currently in, an, in a price today. That's what an offering price is. What does it mean for duties? It, it, it means two things. You have to include the offering price for a vehicle in any advertisement that refers to a specific vehicle, or financing term, or monetary payment amount. So basically, you have to on your website or on in, in any format that you advertise a vehicle, you have to have this offering price, this price that is the total all-in price that includes the dock fee. What they want you to do is have an advertised price that includes all fees and charges and everything else except taxes, okay? So if I may, in dealer speak, that means your addendum. The addendum that is actually on the vehicle needs to have every single fee that is in there except for government fees. So that means your state taxes, et cetera, but dock fees. If you have any add-on products that you are trying to push on the customer before the point of sale, those need to be on the addendum. The addendum needs to specifically match 2AT on your VDP, so your vehicle display page on your website. Any, advertise, any advertisement that you're doing, whether you're doing TV, social, uh, radio, et cetera, all of those need to be exactly the same. So they need to match specifically. So that's what we're talking about in terms of the offering price that has changed. So all of those things that you used to see of click here for e-price, get your internet price because that was a lead generator for us. That is all gone. Everything needs to be specifically printed and visible all the time. They have to be able to get the price with everything that's on it including your dock fees, including anything else that's on the car. You put a tow hitch on that car, you best well believe that it is on there. And every single thing you have needs to match. Because the difference is you have an, a customer that comes in and says, oh, well, this one isn't the same. They're always going to win the case that they can have that lower price no matter what is on the car. And, and it's important to note, this, this offering price is, I always say, it's a, it's a ceiling, not a floor, right? You could, you, the point is you can never sell the person the car, the vehicle for more than that price. You can sell it for less. It can, you can negotiate the price down. Now, it, I always get the question. It doesn't mean the total transaction price can't be higher. If they, if they have voluntary protection products or F&I products or whatever it is, they choose optionally after the fact plus taxes, plus, you know, so it could be a $55,000 car, a transaction price could be, a final transaction maybe 60 grand for a bunch of reasons, but you can't charge more than 55 for the vehicle, right? That's that's the point. Uh, that means you have to make some decisions about what that's gonna be, obviously. Uh, you can always discount from it uh, to a consumer, it's just you can't charge more. So there's two pieces that are important. That's the first, which is you have to have it in the, in, in, and there's caveats to all these things. So I just, you know, the Comply Auto. Uh, uh, yeah, I was going to say we do, we have a lot of resources on our webpage because we're not going to get to all of this. So we've done a lot of research for you. We have webinars on each one of these subjects. We have blog posts. We have a reference guide. We even have a 18-page frequently asked questions. So that's all in our resource now. I'll give you a QR code in a little bit. You guys can go to it and look at it because, uh, I mean, there's a lot here. We, I think we have some examples in a little bit that will kind of show you some advertising aspects. Yeah. And Comply Auto is also 50 state compliant. So <laughs> for the Californian in the room, I'm very concerned about what happens in California. If, you, if you're not in the state, good for you. 
but we have to deal with the most regulation of any other state. So the fact that you have a resource like Comply Auto that 100% is on it for every single state, no matter what dealership you're in, they will be your resource and your guide. Thanks for the plug. Well, there you go. And no, and, and no you, selling here, please. And, and you've and you've softballed. It. Always be closing. <laughs> you softballed the easy question, which is that you're thinking, well, wait, what? What if my state requires me to separately disclose the doc fee or something else? The cars rule would would supersede that. It would it would preempt any state law that's inconsistent with it. So, even though I think in California you have to you're technically supposed to separately disclose the DOT fee, uh, you would no longer be able you'd be able to do that once the yeah, cars rule. So, the, if there's any California dealers in the room, you know that we have to have a buyer's guide. We have to have very specific set of um, documents that are in the purchasing or closing process. A lot of the things that the FTC is addressing through the cars rule, we already have in California. So, but for the rest of you, welcome. Yeah, like all good ideas, their genesis is in California, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, well, let's I'm sorry. get to some of the I, other uh, ones. <laughs> what about the prohibited <laughs> advertising practices? So, uh, so yeah. So that, but that's the offering price. So let me and let me just finish on this because I think this is the other important thing for you to take away. The offering price has to not only be in the advertisement; it also has to be in the first communication you have with the yeah, consumer that about that vehicle. Okay? Yeah. We're gonna, okay? I'm probably getting ahead of the slides. So <laughs> my apologies. Slide but if you if you leave nothing else after the three of us talking about all the bad news, to me it's offering price. Uh, and there's lots of other, not that the other stuff's not important. But the biggest change, I think, and you tell me if you don't think from an it's operation It's the communication of a disclosure. Yeah, it's... So you know. what, what Brad is referring to is, let's say you have a customer, whether they're walking onto your lot, whether they are calling you on the phone, whether they are communicating with your chat, which for the most part, we're all using AI chatbots for that. That has all changed. So if I have someone that comes in and says, hey, L, I would really love to buy that red Acura. Good for me. Before I can even respond back and say, hello, I now need have to send a disclosure. And that disclosure will have the offering price in it. If that customer, I'm talking to them, whether it's chat, text, call, face to face, they say, you know what, I've changed my mind. And now I want, I want the silver one now. Bam, before I can respond with anything, offering price, et cetera, I have to give them a brand new disclosure. Then on top of that, Brad, remind me, what is the uh, rule that says how long I have to keep all of those disclosures? Uh, all communication has to have a stay now. That and, that and a whole litany of other things for 24 months. So you gotta, exactly. you gotta create and retain records to so prove you've done all these So that's things. gonna be a blast for all of us. But so what yeah. the difference is, not only do we have to be concerned about what the offering price is and make sure that we have all of our eggs in that basket, because as Brad said, it's a ceiling, not a floor. You can go down, but you can't go up. From there, anytime we have any communication with a customer, you are slapping them with a the disclosure. So the funny thing to me, is that the FTC says that this rule is going to shorten the window of how long it takes to buy a car. NADA has done their own research, which I'm very glad that they did, but on top of that, they realized that not only does it not shorten it, but it actually lengthen, lengthens it quite a bit. Um, if you can imagine how many times you have to sign a form just because you switched the car. Not everyone is doing what we say of the stats of they're spending 12 to 14 hours online researching a car. There are still those anomalies that just walk in off the lot. But now you're going to slap them disclosure, disclosure, disclosure over and over again because they don't know what car they want. So... So yeah, we can get you started. I, I know it's, yeah. it's 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 look. It's, Someone gave me a microphone. It's not even yeah. a, it's not even effect yet. No, it's but it, but you're right. It's it, at the end of the day, and it, you know, I, let's we'll, we'll give you the other bullets of the big big changes. But but this offering price disclosure is a big deal. It, the thing that you got to wrap your head around is it's not just. Uh, a, like a TILA disclosure where you're doing it at some time prior to consummation and it's in a controlled setting with trained F&I people. This is anybody on the behalf of the store that's communicating with the consumer. Or a bot. Or a bot or anything, right? Any Anything or one that's communicating has to have this, this disclosure. And then you got to have a way to keep a records of it. So, you know, you are probably going to have to think about ways to, to, to look to automation and vendors and other things to help you with that. And, and, and the cloud. So, Get a cloud if you don't have A one. cloud. So, so that's offering price. Again, we could spend an hour and a half just on that. But that's, that's a concept that if you'd leave with nothing else, you should keep in mind. The second, and I think is, is, is touched on here, is we call it advertising practices, but really what it is is a, a, a list of 16 issues where there's prohibited misrepresentations. So it's mainly in the advertising space, but it's also true in face-to-face -face communications. Mm -hmm. And they've just listed sort of these 16 broad topics of things. Is it a finance release? 
Uh, can you take the vehicle out of the country? Uh, what about uh, repossession of the vehicle under what military. circumstances? Mil military. Yeah, there's, so again, we could spend an, uh, easily spend a few hours just on these issues. What, you'll look at them and say, well, we don't, we don't make misrepresentations about this stuff. It's important to dig into the details, look at the guidance that's coming out, because it's really going to inform things about the way that you have uh, make you say things about the vehicle, both in advertisements and in face-to-face -face communications with the consumer. Uh, you know, there's it, obviously if, if there's misleading information, if there's a price posted somewhere and it's unclear if it's a finance deal or a lease deal, that's probably going to be deceptive, right? That's that's always been the case. But they've sort of they've raised the bar on all these topics, and and of course. At the end of the day, each time you do this is going to be a violation of fifty one thousand seven hundred and twenty five dollars or whatever it is. So, so that's you know we've got some examples here. Uh, you know, um, not only do you have to say these oops, have to say these things, but um, can you hear me? Uh, you have to you have to make sure you don't make any any uh, misstatements or or pro prohibited statements, but they have to be unavoidable. So, in other words, there's no more. Uh, click here for more. There's no more putting the relevant information in small print at the bottom of the ad. You have to make it, uh, they say, unavoidable. Same font, same same place on the on the ad. So same do we have, size. Same size. Is there same language? Obviously, okay. to go to the next slide. Do we see? I think so, there's like some examples. Yeah. So a couple examples. Obviously, this kind of thing is not going to cut it anymore. I don't want to to to, uh, to you know say that that's a that's a bad ad or anything like that. I'm not picking anybody in particular, but those are some. But examples I think one of the things to realize too is we don't always know what customer is going to have what credit, right? So we can't necessarily say this is going to be your payment because we don't know what they're going to be approved for on their APR. So all of those things fall into this rule. So the price that you're putting out there should only be the offering price. Do not quote a monthly payment that you cannot match, that you don't know. If you're going to quote a monthly payment, it should be for your subprime. Because if you have someone that comes in with exceptional credit and they can qualify for a lower payment, they will, one, get that, but it could come back to hurt you in the end. So it changes the way that we're advertising. It changes the way we're getting lead generation and it changes the way that we're going to sell a car. So all things to be aware of. And you could, let's, let's go through a couple of, I know we, we told you we gave you a lot of slack, but we talked about the offering price, um, uh, and we talked about this as well. I mean, one thing just in highlighting the offering price, for example, is rebates, yeah. uh, which, which is also- EVs. The, uh, EVs is a, yeah. is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. So the theory is you have an offering price. It's a $50,000 vehicle. Let's say it's a $50,000 EV. You can't, in an ad, say, uh, net cost forty two five because everybody doesn't qualify for the EV rebate. You can only ever put rebates. You can only factor in a rebate in your offering price if every single person it's available to everybody. Okay, so you can say fifty. You could even probably say may qualify for seventy five hundred dollar rebate if it's in the same font if it's if it's disclosed properly. But you can't then say forty two five. So, and I know there's always been a problem with rebate stacking and people don't do that anymore, hopefully, but this is going to be a little bit of a change too, because it just, there's, it's just, a, it's just in, in our culture, we want to make sure people know about these offers. The problem is if they're not available to everybody, you can't factor them into the advertised price. So that's a good example of, yeah. of, of that. Well, and we may have, qualify. We you may, may qualify. Uh, yes. Right. And you, and again, to, I, I always want to be careful. There's always caveats to all these things. You could probably put it in the ad as long as it was, is disclaimed properly. It's just that you can't put that forty two five. You can't do what you want to do, which is say, "Hey, it's a fifty thousand dollar car, but you're going to pay for forty two five, right?" So you just can't do that. Well, I want to make sure that we have time for yes. a couple of questions. So this, we did put a lot of information because we wanted to give you as much information as possible. I told you about some of those other resources, so please, you can download this. But what are some ways that dealers are going to be able to like manage these rules? I mean, I think a big one is and you're, this is very big in your is train. And then, you know, you're going to have to ha audit all of your marketing, like your third-party websites, and, like, get on the same page with them. But are, what are some other solutions? Well, I think, first and foremost, training is going to be the most important because it really takes in the entire sales process. Our entire communication has now been disrupted and will change. So whether we have to hit them with the disclosure first and make sure that they're signing it, we need to make sure that our employees and our managers are aware of it. Then it also goes to the offer price. What are we actually offering? Is it the price that we think it is because we know that they qualify for a rebate? Absolutely not. We know that it needs to be the price, the addendum needs to match it, VDP, everywhere that car exists in the world. 
we need to make sure those prices are reflective of the same. So a lot of those things, it's going to be housekeeping, uh, what you're doing actually in the store, how you are building out your inventory. You have to think about your inventory too now. So are we buying cars that people will not look at what we say is this, the sticker shock, but now they're getting the actual price. So are we going to give them that sticker shock through that? So what you're buying in your inventory matters as well. But as Cheryl mentioned as well, any kind of advertisement, yes, I mentioned the offer price, it needs to match. The disclosures are key. Yeah, so we're getting to the disclosure page. Exactly. But so the disclosure that you have, you sh if you're posting a car on Facebook Marketplace, for instance, do you have a disclosure on that? Most dealers do not. And that's something that you 100% should have. But how are you getting that disclosure? Do you have an in-house counsel or are you making it up as you go? These are all things that become very important and vital because, as Brad mentioned, it is a very large fine. Nobody wants that. And, and it's, and, and, you know, the, the social media one, it, it, in my mind, the other thing is uh, always vendors. I mean, mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of coordination you're going to need. For the vendors in the room, don't be, don't be surprised when your dealers come and say, hey, I need your help because they're going to have to make sure that that offer, let's say, they, let's say they have an offering price on a used vehicle, right? And it's in their, on their, uh, you know, on an inventory website, and they change it. Well, you can't have two different offering prices, even if it's on two or three or four different platforms. Does it have to be instantaneous? I don't know that they've been that clear, but it can't be different, right? And so you're going to have some problems. It's going to really require a lot of coordination with your vendors, especially your advertising vendors. And then, you know, like you said, uh, social media is a great tool. We had, there's a panel before this on the use of social media. If you're talking about prices and social media, you, you know, just you remember that's it. an advertisement, A, and B, if it changes or the car sells, like you can't, one of the things you can't, that's a misrepresentation is you can't have a advertisement for a vehicle that's already been sold or not an inventory. Uh, so if that's been sold, you got to go and change it. And mm -hmm. how do you do that? So all those sort of technical processes, I think are going to be challenging. Pro tip. Uh, for those of us that are actually listing cars in the room, put an expiration date on your offer. So social media, let's say you posted something 30 days ago, that car is still in your inventory. Let's say you, the, you've got a lot of action on it, it still hasn't sold, and you choose to raise the price. If that advertisement still exists on the internet, any buyer can come in with a lower listed price and demand that price, and you have to adhere to it. So if you do not have an expiration date included in your disclosure, you will stand by that price forever. So that's a pro tip as well. But it's, it's crazy. I mean, the things that we have to do now. And, and you know, look, we, we haven't even had a chance to talk about some of the other disclosures, yeah. like monthly also, payment disclosures and things like that. Vendors so. in the room, if a dealer asks you to sign a vendor agreement and you're not signing it, expect to lose their business. Because if I go to one of my vendors and say, I need you to sign this agreement saying that you are going to act in the fair faith for me as a dealer, but also adhere to my policies, and they won't sign it, I will not be doing business with them anymore. This is how serious it is. Yeah, and look, I, I, one more vendor example, just a, a, again for the vendors in the room, if you're thinking about this. One of the other disclosure requirements we even touch on is the monthly payments. So if you give someone a monthly payment, you also have to give them a disclosure about what the total of the payments is. And then if you give them a different monthly payment that, could, that is lower but could result in a higher total payment, you got to give another disclosure document. Okay. What does that mean? Okay, that could be a piece of paper, it could be a, something electronic, but what about uh, tools on your website that have monthly payments, you know, the sliders or something, you know, here, a month, a month, a month, mount down, APR. Each of those is, are likely going to be a monthly payment disclosure and may need another document given. So there's gonna have to be some real thought from the vendor world about, uh, you know, and it's, it's too bad because those are helpful and consumers like those things. But that's, you know, at a certain point, you got to say uh, there's, a, there's a risk here. But the we're all doing this for the consumers, right? Well, that's exactly. what the rule says. Yeah, it's exactly. for the benefit of the so. consumer. And in the end, in my personal opinion, it makes the car shopping experience a bit more tangled. Well, they should have given you a day yeah. on this, Brad. Yeah. But well, we, we, we get between two of us, we could get really fired up. Yeah, you guys get do, really so. fired up. So uh, I want to make sure that we have, like, I think we're at time. So if there's any questions, and then I'm also going to pull up those QR codes if you guys have questions um, and you want to get to those resources. It's on our website. I don't care if you're a customer or anything. We just really want to help you um, with those. And then also Comply Auto was selected by NADA to help uh, with their FTC cars. There's a webinar coming up too, right? There is a webinar coming up. But there's also, we're going to be the official help co-author with NADA, the guide to the FTC cars. So I, I may have something to do with that. Uh, I wonder. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> you wrote it on both sides now, so yeah. make sure you call me. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have any questions? Okay, great. They're oh, there's one. Up. There's one quick. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can we have a live question? Is that allowed? Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, does this affect the service department? So. Uh, and does it affect the service? Probably not directly. I mean, it's a, it's a little more complicated than that. Some of this is written so broadly that we thought at first it might, but I, it's it's generally speaking, it's in connection with this with the sailor financing of a vehicle. So it'll affect the service department to the extent that they're putting physical add-ons on a on a on a vehicle yeah. and that kind of thing. So there there are going to be some implications, but it doesn't mean you have to have new disclosures for oil for on your ROs or things like that. Correct. So you wouldn't have to do a disclosure on your RO, but if you are doing equity mining in your service drive, one hundred percent. That's it will one. affect yeah. it. So yeah. if you have cars that are coming to your service drive and you're looking at the equity and you're trying to flip them into a new car, not only, obviously, the car that you're trying to get them into will be affected by this, but the price that you're offering for their car has to follow the same rules. So it does affect your service department mostly in the equity mining. In terms of your day-to-day -day fixed ops, what you're doing on an RO, no. Your, your oil change price does not have to have a specific disclosure attached to it. Equity mining, 100%. The rules kind of around truth and lending, sort of like yeah. to make that a cars, yeah. yeah. Financing. So it is yeah. the car shopping rule, but so again, equity mining it falls right into your your uh, variable as well. well I think I, each of these we could we could spend a lot of time on. There's the concept <laughs> of add-ons under the rule. They call them add. We think that's actually derogatory too. But add-ons is not just F and I products. It's anything physical or Toe otherwise hitch. that is either. Added on, uh, put on the vehicle or sold to the consumer by someone other than the yeah. manufacturer. Yeah. So it's basically anything yeah. physical or F and I product related, and that's in that case parts and service could be implicated. Uh, I that. think we had a few more questions, but we're getting the hook. Okay. So okay. Brad is going to we'll be in the back or yeah. in the yeah in the lobby. Um, he's a wealth of resources, and then again visit our website. Um, if you need anything, you have questions, we're always here to help dealers. Uh, so thank you for having us. And thank you, Elle, for being here. And thank you, Brad, for thank being an expert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.